Robin Hansen. I've been on the board for two years, uh, the Ex-Mormon Foundation board for two years. Um, for those of you who were here for open mic last night, this is the two and a half minute talk, I promised. So, um, you know, and when Sue called me and asked me if I would speak today, I tried to come up with every excuse in the book. But you know, now that I'm here standing in front of you, I am overwhelmed with emotion, and I know this is exactly where I was meant to be. <laughs> Not for you, but for me. This is what I needed. <laughs> now, seriously, um, when, we, when Grant agreed to come speak, I begged Sue to let me do the introduction. Um, as she said, she doesn't normally do much with introductions because we put so much in the program, which I would definitely um, direct you to your program to see um, Grant's qualifications and, and the great things that he's done. Uh, so I'm going to start with just a little anecdote or let you know how we're here right now, which um, back in 2002, which is when he uh, wrote Insider's View of Mormon Origins, um, of course, I had no idea. <laughs> But in 2004, uh, when he was called to his court of love, um, it was all <laughs> over the news, and so I could hardly miss it. And um, that was in my height of piety, <laughs> I guess we could say. And I was very resentful of Grant. And how could he be so disloyal? Um, I was really upset and read everything I could. Well, I happened to find a few excerpts, uh, because of course I can't read anti-Mormon literature, so of course I couldn't actually read the book before I made it. <laughs> but I did find a few excerpts online, and I was like, this doesn't sound bad. There must be really, really bad stuff they're not telling us. Um, but then I also found it was curious when I realized he was disfellowshipped and not excommunicated. So that also left me a little bit of curious, and I just tucked that information in the back of my head. And the reason why I was particularly outraged um, by this is Grant was my um, seminary teacher my sophomore year in high school, at Brighton High School, and I believe that was his last year teaching. And another thing I tucked away is he had an excellent reputation for his integrity for his honesty, for his kindness to the students. Um, he was among the favorite um, seminary teachers there. So, um, so of course this had a little more impact um, on me and being kind of bewildered. So, um, so when I finally decided to leave the church, it wasn't until 2007. So three years later and and actually, I hadn't read any of the stuff that everyone else did because, of course, that's naughty. You can't Google, you know, certain terms. And, um, <laughs> but finally, one day, I just, at least for me, it seemed to be soul-crushing. And I believed the church was true, but I never liked it. And I finally decided when I saw it, um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you've heard there has to be two things present, right, to leave. You've got to not believe it and you've got to hate it, because one or the other, and, and you can stay and be fine. But, uh, so anyway, I finally hated it enough, and, um, and I could see what it was doing to my children. I guess that's what kicked me <coughs> over the edge, what it was doing to my kids. And also, right about the same time, this thought came into my head, which is, what if they're all just men? And that was like my aha moment. <laughs> like, of course they're all just men. <laughs> which freed me to read whatever I wanted to, and of course, Grant's was the first book I read, because I had to know what was so bad. And I'm so grateful to Grant, because that is what confirmed, in, for me in my heart, that I had absolutely made the right choice. Um, and so I've been kind of a little, like, feeling like a groupie, but way too shy to contact him for a long time. Um, so it's been five years I've been out, so finally, um, a year ago, year and a half, two maybe, um, I finally got up the courage to contact Grant and we went out to lunch. And he is lovely as ever. <laughs> you know, I really enjoyed the lunch. 
And of course, I, trying to you know, ease into, will you come speak at the conference? <laughs> we have been wooing Grant for years. <laughs> and uh, when he turned me down last year, I said, well, is it okay for me to keep asking? You know, do you mind if I ask again? And he goes, no, you go ahead and ask again. You may not get a different answer. <laughs> and so finally this year, he said yes. And just one of the highlights of my year. Um, so that's, that's the story there. And I, I don't think I have anything to say more than that besides get ready for a really good, uh, really good information <coughs> from a very good man. Thank you for your generous comments, uh, Robin. And thank you to Ex-Mormon Foundation for, for inviting me again. There's been three or four invitations in there in the last 10 years. Um, welcome pioneers is what I would say to all of you. Um, a pioneer, one definition of a pioneer, at least to me, is uh, someone who tells the rest of the story. And we have a lot of people in this audience or who attended this conference that are telling the rest of the story. We have Signature Books here who's been doing this for nearly 30 years. Major contribution. We have ex-Mormon Foundation here. They're telling the rest of the story. Uh, Postmormon.org, I, I understood they were here. I don't know about Mormon discussions. I know Mormon think has been here. And each of you are trying to become a little more articulate in what you, what you might have to say to your family or friends or acquaintances. Um, I, I think it's important that we that 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 this occurs because we're really trying to to get uh, people to take a look at the rest of the story, and as Paul Harvey used to say, and as you know, that's not so easy to do. I said to one of my children, uh, and I and I mean this. Uh, she, uh, she's been, she called, called to be a Relief Society president out here in a suburban neighborhood at 36 and is a very lovely person. And I said to her, says, you know, I'm, I'm really interested in your happiness uh, foremost. Uh, but you really don't know much about Joseph Smith. And if I had my wish, I would wish that you would take a serious look or a deep dive into Mormon history and find out and then if you whatever you do I'll, I'll be supportive and maybe you'll understand me a little better and we'll have a little better relationship well so far that hasn't worked but <laughs> let me just say a few things uh, make a few observations before we get into the aha moments of my research um, earlier this week I had a phone call from a return mission president. And uh, he said he'd read my book and he knew the church was not true. And that's an ongoing story and I won't get into that because he doesn't want to be compromised. And I said to him, I says, well, who, who told you about my book? And he says, a general authority. First Quorum of Seventy. And he wants to get in on the act too, but that's all I'll say about that. It's an ongoing story. But I thought, that's very interesting. And, and he doesn't, he knows the church isn't true either. But so many of them never speak out, or at least they haven't. Um, now, Tom Phillips, a lot of you are on the internet know about him. He's a stake president who I think did a very good thing. He, he received his second anointing and uh, probably at the hands of Jeffrey Holland, Elder Holland. But um, 
He asked him, he says, I'd like you to answer these 15 questions. And if you can't, I'd like you to write a letter to my family telling them I'm okay, that there's reasons why I'm no longer active in the church. And I don't want you passing me off to someone else. You're the prophet, seer, and revelator, Elder Holdren. Please answer these questions. And as some of you know, he got a reply back that just said, well, you made me heart sick, sick to my stomach. No letter and no answers. But he spoke out. And we're talking about recent developments. And I think from what this, this mission president said to me earlier this week, I think it's beginning to penetrate the upper echelons of the church. And I emphasize beginning. I went to lunch oh, a few months back with a current mission president. And I could say a lot more. He, he's more than a one-time mission president. Uh, he read my book. He wanted to go to lunch. And he doesn't believe the church is true at all. In fact, he claims to be an atheist and has been for the several missions that he has been on and is now. And I says, how do you do that? I says, it's not like they're asking you to be a nursery leader. <laughs> he says, well, I just couldn't turn Elder Holland down. And my wife is so, such a true believer in her family that I fear her more than telling the truth. <laughs> Uh, you've heard about the Swedish rescue and the third quorum of 70 member Matson is inactive in the church. He's looked into it. Also the top LDS woman in Sweden. I think her name is Christina Foot. They have left and it's, they've taken a number with them. So there's another 70, Gerald Nephi McChesney. You may have heard of him four, five, six years ago. Stake president a couple of times, bishop a couple of times. Uh, he's uh, head of the Board of Regents at uh, Oklahoma State University. He's the first temple president. I think he was in an area presidency. He looked into things. He and his wife have left. He did not like the answers that Elder Didier from the first quorum of 70 gave him to his questions. They're gone. Um, I know. 10 seminary and institute teachers who think just like I do. Um, and so you begin to see the beginnings of penetrating the upper echelons of the church. And I emphasize beginnings. I think you also see it impacting on the teenagers of the church. And I think from the perspective of the church, it was a very smart thing to do what they did. Uh, conference weekend, I understand. There's a lot of giddy senior girls in high school who are putting their papers in in droves. And they will get a lot more, a lot more missionaries. I don't know uh, how that will... Uh, the message is flawed, as, as we know, and I don't know how that's going to work out. Uh, they seem to convert a lot, but they don't retain a whole lot. But I think you're beginning to see uh, um, some of that going on. And I think uh, uh, a well-placed source has told me uh, that the church had determined that on the Wasatch Front, that is from Spanish Fork to Logan, they're getting about one of two 19-year-olds to go on a mission that are eligible to go on a mission. There's a lot of them that are not, you know but one of two eligible, and I think this move will probably improve that statistic for them. Uh, another statistic that I'm even more sure, certain of is that after five years of being home from a mission, 45% of the missionaries no longer have a temple recommend. That is a big concern because that's the leadership of the church. Uh, I gave a talk out in Saratoga Springs a few years ago, actually, and there were 10 couples there, 
They were all in their 20 and 30s. They, between them all, had two to four children and, and they had all left the church and they took all their kids with them, of course. This is the church's worst nightmare and this is happening on a regular basis. But the 20 and 30 somethings are leaving in large numbers and we're beginning to see it penetrate the upper levels of the church and into the teenage levels. It's just a matter of time before we're gonna see more uh, teenagers, 18 year olds, 17 year olds, that are gonna take a serious look at this. And so they have reason to be concerned about what's going on. Another a little observation, uh, they're going after those who are influencing the true believers. And uh, David Tweed is the managing editor, whatever he is, of Mormon Think, uh, just resigned, I understand. And uh, before that, the founder of Mormon Think, who's a good friend of mine, uh, he resigned because they both had church court dates. Now, I don't know, it doesn't matter what the church says why they're disciplining these people. A year ago, uh, the founder told me that uh, he doesn't want to have his name bantied about. I think he goes by Bill. Uh, he tells me that they had their first 500,000 hits on Mormon Think last October, this month. And in July, they had a million one. And that's when they started proceedings on him or shortly after. In September, it was three million, all just a little bit under three million hits. They have reason to be concerned. So anyway, I, I, I look upon all of us as, as kind of pioneers. Uh, and here's a chance to, to uh, continue to learn and, and what have you. Uh, I'd say another thing, I think the apologists have lost the war. <laughs> I mean that sincerely. After 23 years, they've gotten rid of farms and the people down at farms, a little bit too mean-spirited, not very Christian on a Christian university, or one who claims to be Christian university. Um, their scholarship, and that's, that's a hard word to swallow of what they've been doing. <laughs> Uh, they're demonizing and ad hominem articles and going after characters of authors like myself. I think, um, and they're not getting the job done. If you listen carefully to what Marlon Jensen said, that the church is bleeding, farms is supposed to stop the bleeding, they're not. And I think they've been dismissed. I don't know the full story for why they were, but they're not getting the job done. And now they're going to start, the church says, uh, to uh, be a little more truthful in manuals and seminary curricula, institute curricula. And you and I know that's not quite true because if they were that honest, uh, they'd be really lining up to leave. <laughs> so... From my perspective, there's a, they've really given up on trying to answer these problems of the last 25 years. There's no one in the top 15 in the church who can do it. We heard Elder Holland try on the BBC interview. <laughs> not good. Uh, they're not putting anyone in that body who, uh, who could answer it. In fact, when churches gets more and more under siege, you can tell because they start putting their relatives in these positions <laughs> that they can trust that won't fall away. Well, whatever that may be, I, I just think that uh, the overall vitality of the church is, is not what it once was. James E. Talmage, Apostle Talmage, around 100 years ago almost, literally, wrote a book called The Vitality of Mormonism, and I've seen that slide. And uh, young people who go to the, the church are saying that it's not as vibrant as uh, they remember their parents saying it was, but I, I don't know. I haven't been to church for about eight, eight years or nine. Um, anyway, I think they've lost that war. 
And now you're hearing more things like, uh, I had a daughter and her husband and two boys leave the church two months ago, and the answers they got is, well, even if it's false, you know, even if it's false, stay anyway. And they said to those, well, that's not how the church presents itself. <laughs> uh, it's the only true church, and the Book of Mormon is this, and, and, and so forth. Uh, so I see the, the air kind of going out of the balloon slowly in, in, as far as relevancy. And, you know, it's like a balloon in the corner, and you walk by it every three days, and it's getting a little, you know, less vibrant, a <laughs> little less... Uh, a little less vital, and I think in many ways that's what happened. But I do think what the church has done with the with the 18 year olds are going to have their problems. But I think it will probably give them more numbers, and uh, so forth. All right, one more one more thing, and this kind of leads into our our talk. My gosh, this is going fast. Um, in 1965, I. Uh, my professor James Clayton at the University of Utah in history, he says, why don't you join us? We're having a seminar on Mormon stuff. And Leonard Arrington, uh, who used to be our church historian, is organizing it. And it was like six weeks, guest speaker. Well, the last speaker was Earl Olson. He was at the time assistant church historian. Leonard Arrington was not yet our historian, church historian. And right at the end, he says, Earl, how about going down to the archives and maybe you could open the first presidency's vault and we could see some artifacts. He says, okay. So 13 of us went down and I think most of them are dead. I was about the youngest guy in that session. And I didn't know the significance of it at the time, but he brought out some handwriting of Joseph Smith, some of his hair, and three seer stones that belonged to Joseph Smith. One of them was a little white stone, about like, like that, and it was shaped like a baby's foot. And for years I, I thought, what does that mean? Well, you know when you stamp a baby's foot on a, on a blessing book or a baby book, it's kind of narrow at one end, and then as it gets up to the toes, it gets uh, wider. And that's what it looked like, a, a white stone, small about the size of a baby foot and shaped like a baby's foot. And then there was another stone that looked like milk chocolate. It was the size of a softball, about like that. And someone, it's like someone had molded mud in a, dried mud in a ditch or nearly dried and had put it together and you could still see the finger marks to mold that stone that had become extremely hard. In fact, I tried to, you know, test the end of one of the, and it, and it was, I couldn't even break it. Not that I was trying, but it, it was just solid rock. And it had a handle on it so you could carry it. They had molded the, the stone and then they had a little cup-like saucer handle on it so you could carry the thing around. That was another seer stone of Joseph Smith. And then, of course, the third one was the one he used for the complete translation of the Book of Mormon, the one we have today. Very significant, excuse me, very significant stone. Almost black with white streaks in it, about the, bigger than a chicken's egg, smaller than a turkey egg, about like that. He found it in a well in the Clark Chase's property, which is very close to the Smith family. And of course, being curious, I got right up to it and I couldn't see a thing in it. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't know how significant that was. Uh, I had just graduated from the University of Utah in history and I'd seen all three stones and come to find out that's almost unheard of. There's just no one. And so I, I thought, wow, because I didn't think that much of it at the time. I thought everybody got to see that. So when I did my book, Insider's View, I tried to get a picture of it. There are no pictures of that stone. 
Joseph Smith does not mention that he used that stone in the official history of the church. I suggest that they may want to take a picture in case the stone disappeared. At least they'd have a picture. That argument went nowhere. But it, that stone helps you understand early Mormonism. And if you don't understand their more mindset, you really don't understand early Mormonism. Um, when I was institute director, I used to collect personages that Joseph Smith had seen. And a lot of things were seen in the Kirtland Temple. One day I asked Kati Edgar Lyon, who was a Nauvoo historian for the church, institute teacher for many years, how do they see so much stuff and we don't see it today? And he gave me an answer. I'm not sure it's correct, but it's funny. He says, he says, well, if you fast for two days and then drink a lot of beer, <laughs> you will see things. <laughs> like I say, it's funny, but I don't think it's correct. It, it might have contributed. But I had a list of like 47 personages that Joseph Smith had seen and a good number of them at the Kirtland Temple. One day they're out working on the temple and standing by a grape fence, according to Zebedee Coltrane, 70 at the time. And he says, well, uh, and, they, and, and Joseph says, there's Adam and Eve. Described her as having dark hair, black eyes. And I thought, why don't members today see stuff and you hear various speculations, well, this was the era of the Restoration, so they needed all of this stuff, or we're not as righteous as they were. But I think it's, I think it's different than that, and it goes back to the mindset of Joseph Smith and his family. You realize the first 50 to 70 converts of Mormonism were, were treasure hunters? or had the treasure hunting mindset. Polly and Orrin Porter Rockwell, the Newell Knight family, the uh, David, uh, the Knight family, Joseph Knight Sr., Oliver Cowdery, Martin Harris, all of the Smiths, Josiah Stoll. And they all thought the way I'm gonna tell you they thought back then in the church. Um, I'm going to read you just a couple of statements here out of my book in chapter 6 on witnesses to the gold plates. Um, Michael Quinn did a good thing when he wrote The Magic Worldview because it convinced a lot of LDS people that the Smiths were up to here in magic. Uh, my book is a little more dangerous than that because it crossed a second bridge showing how that that magical worldview impacted on two or three foundations of the Mormon faith. And even though President Hinckley said it had nothing to do with it, he was wrong. Um, it's what they used to call second sight. And the scriptural phrase for that is our eyes were open, or the eyes of our understanding were open. In other words, the mind. <laughs> They're seeing these people in their mind. And this is a real aha moment for me to realize that this is what they're doing. They're not seeing all these personages that I had listed as an institute director. If you read section 110, the Doctrine and Covenants, read verse 1. The eyes of our understanding were opened. Or seven sec section 76, where the Savior is seen, and it says that they saw Jesus by the eyes of our understanding. It's a mental thing. It's not physical. The word see is not what happened. They perceive. That's important. They perceive. They didn't see. They perceive. They, they, they saw it. They felt that he was there, or they, they felt that uh, uh, their imagination or 
their mind suggested this to them. Martin Harris used to see Christ on cross beams and uh, talking out of donkeys' mouths and uh, and uh, oh, it, it's uh, it's it, the list is quite goes on. But but this is what uh, Joseph's mother, Josiah, stole hired Joseph to hunt for buried treasure because Joseph could discern things invisible to the natural eye. That's second sight. Or as her birth, Booth says, Joseph can see these beings, spiritual, secular, even when his eyes are shut. There it is again, you see. Or section 110, where Joseph and Oliver Cowdery are behind three curtains Three little pulpits and the congregation is there. If you'd have pulled those curtains away, you, the audience would not have seen those personages. And who are the personages? Well, Jesus shows, Moses, Elijah, Elias. You see, all by the eyes of their understanding. So they're not, this is not quite as impressive as it sounds. And, and, uh, they saw a lot of stuff because Joseph had taught them. These New York Mormons, when they got to Ohio, taught them how to think this way. Joseph was the leader, as Brigham Young said. They would see things. Well, getting ahead here a little bit. Um, um, so, so this is what they're seeing. In fact, one person says, we saw convoy after convoy of angels in the Kirtland Temple, all by the eyes of our understanding. Again, that's the, the phrase, the scriptural phrase for second sight. Now, if the church really believed that Joseph Smith could see in his seer stone, they would be then willing to tell us not only the stuff that he saw about spiritual historical personages, but also the guardian spirits in the hills. But they do not for a very good reason. And when Joseph got to Ohio, he understood this would not play well with those coming out of organized churches like Signe Rigdon, like Isaac Morley, like the Pratt brothers. So they didn't talk about it. But this is what's going on, and if they really believed, like I say, that he could see spiritual personages, and he's using the same stone to see the treasure guardians that he is to translate the Book of Mormon, to see these spiritual personages. They don't tell you that. It's the rest of the story. Well, when I, when I learned this, this is kind of an aha moment. This helps me understand early Mormon history. Well, much could be said about that, but I think we'll, we'll move on. Um, it's interesting how uh, LDS people think if they find anything, science or history, that supports anything that the church or Joseph Smith said, they latch onto that and they'll, they'll go with the Nahum thing or they'll, you know how they do that. But really, they're deniers of history. They're deniers of history. They will not take a look at it. And so, if the spirit doesn't say it so, that trumps science, that trumps history. And that's an important choice people have because if the spirit trumps everything else, then that's where you're gonna end up. And that's what I told my daughter, that we'll just have faith or stay in even if it's false or go by your feelings. Well. That's why I think they've lost the war, because they they really don't have any ammunition. They're just not that effective. Well, all right. Some of you have seen a, a two-page summary of my book. It's available if you go on to uh, my home page is on mormonthink.com, um, and if you put Grant Palmer home page, you'll see everything I've done in the last 10 years. All the TV things, all the articles, including this summary of an insider's view of Mormon origins. And uh, 
it kind of summarizes the book. The first four chapters of my book talk about the Book of Mormon. The last four talk about the four foundational visions of the church. And those four foundational visions are the eight witnesses, uh, the angel gold plate story, the priesthood restoration, and the first vision. And they are embellished in that order by Joseph Smith. And I won't go into the details of that except to say this was an aha moment for me because it's not just one of the four founding foundational visions. It's all four. They all show the same characteristic. They start out rather mundane and they become more impressive. They become more physical. They become more unique. They become more embellished. And yes, they become more miraculous. And that is an aha moment for me. It's not one, it's all four. We could give examples, spend easily the rest of the time talking about that. In the first vision, Joseph and the priesthood, those impressive versions come at a time when he's in trouble with his own leadership. That's when the priesthood gets really exciting and interesting. And the first vision. Uh, take a first vision motive. In his 1832 count, no mention of a devil. 35, he hears steps. Time he gets to 38, it's a knockdown, life and death struggle with the devil. And if that was the only one that uh, embellished, maybe we could forget it. But we got five or six motives that do that. It's the same with the priesthood. He gets it by the Spirit, according to the Book of Commandments. And then by 35, its angels are kind of around there somehow. And then by 30, and then a few years later, it's physical ordinations, laying on of hands, and named angels, John the Baptist, Peter, James, and John. This is the way it goes. And so that was kind of a aha moment. And you know, I have a good friend who's a fed, federal judge, and he teaches a constitutional law class, says, what do you do when you get a person like that? And he says, well, their testimony's impeached. If they get on the stand and start, you know, everything gets more miraculous, you think, oh, well, there goes that testimony. And, and so that's kind of what's happening. Um, I think you can show from six sources Joseph Smith produced 75% of the Book of Mormon right out of his own backyard, things he's familiar with. And I'm, our time is really going, so I'm going to have to be really quick here. First and second Nephi is all about the Bible, a King James Bible, a 1769 edition of the Bible because it carries the errors of that translation. This is not a mystery. Also, Joseph is using, it looks to be like several of his father's dreams. One right in chapter one of 1 Nephi 1 and another on Lehi's tree of life. There's another source. Yes. What? Oh, do we? All right, then. <clears throat> Second Nephi, half of those chapters are right out of the King James Bible, including the errors of the 1769 edition of the King James Bible. Wow, did these come off brass plates of Laban? Or plates they dug out of a ground? I don't think so. These are very practical things, folks. That's First and Second Nephi. Jacob, Enos, Mosiah, Alma 1 through 42. That's all about Methodist stuff. When I was working on a PhD in American history at BYU, I took a deep dive into one of my four areas was the history of religion in America. And I focused on the second great awakening, which is Joseph Smith's era. And I was astonished at the preachers. They are dead ringers for the 11 preachers 
in Jacob, Enos, Mosiah, and Alma up to chapter 42. Those 11 preachers sound just like what he would have heard in his own environment when he went to revivals and especially Methodist, which he was somewhat partial to. And you will see the four-step conversion pattern of his era. You will see the same phraseology of the Bible, the King James Bible. You will see frontier rhetoric. You will see the same pattern from A to Z. And you can check this. This is not a theory. Let me give you one example of those 12. King Benjamin. King Benjamin, I found, were one mile from Palmyra on June 6, 1826, a very formative time in Joseph Smith's life. This is in my chapter 4, all of this stuff about the 11 preachers. One mile from his home. He said he went as often as he could get there. I think he was at this one, and I'll tell you why. It's in my book, but I'll tell you anyway. He, what the Methodists like to do is to consecrate the ground of a revival area. One mile from Palmyra, June 6, 1826. 15 months before Joseph gets the golden plates. The famous Methodist prelate named Bishop McKendry is going to give his last discourse. And he is weak, and he is feeble, and he is beloved, and he is going to give a talk on personal salvation. And everybody on the ground makes a commitment to Christ except little children. That sound familiar? If it doesn't, I'll keep going. 10,000 people were there. They, the whole Ontario district was coming to honor this sainted man. And they built a little pulpit. And one of the ministers would sit up there by the name of Benjamin G. Paddock is on that stand. And they put the tents around that stand. And he gives this discourse. And people are falling down. They are moved emotionally, just like King Benjamin's speech. We call that the falling exercise in the Great Awakening, Second Great Awakening. And you come away from that, and I found every source I could who touched on that revival of June 6, 1826. And I've got them all documented in there in the book in chapter 4. That's one example of the 11 preachers. Now, they're not all that detailed, but they're following the conversion pattern, the phraseology, everything is the same. And you come away and say, do I really think that falling exercise happened in ancient America among all that shrubbery <laughs> in ancient America? No. This has come down from the Reformation. And this is what you've got. It is very, very hard to explain that away. And then Benjamin, when he sees a person who's in the falling exercise or emotionally affected, they call that being under conviction, and they bring him up to the altar. That's the little bench in front of the stand. They call it the altar of God, and those are the phrases that are used by Benjamin in the Book of Mormon. And after the thing is over, and they've all made a covenant to Christ, having heard this sainted man, this feeble last discourse, they appoint the stations of the preachers and that phrase is in there too. That is a Methodist term. And yet the people at BYU says he went word for word and translated out of that stone. Well, all right. So that's first and second Nephi. That's Jacob, Enos, Mosiah, Alma 1 through 42. Alma 43 through 63 is the war chapters. And I believe Tom 
Donofro has written something on that. And it, I think these chapters reflect the war strategies of the, strategies of the American Indian Wars and especially the War of 1812 and British Indian fighting strategies against Colonel Jackson, Helaman, one through seven, is about Ganeatonism, and it's this is 1828 nine, and Andrew Jackson's running for president, and he's a Mason, and boy are they vilifying him. They're speculating what. General Jackson will do if he's president to the executive branch of government and the judicial. You see the same phrases in those chapters. You see the same plans and designs and speculations. The Smiths had a news, read a newspaper. They took a newspaper. They can read. All right, Third Nephi 11 through 28. That's the ministry of Jesus in the New World, according to the Book of Mormon. In those chapters, there are 490 verses. 50% come right out of a King James Bible of 1769. 50%. You can recognize the phrases or whole passages or whole chapters. Ether. This gets a little more speculative, but I think it's what I believe. This book is Joseph Smith's essay on the central message of the Book of Mormon. The first seven chapters of Ether tells what happens when you follow Christ, the last eight when you do not. It's a miniature Book of Mormon, or a Nephite civilization experience. Uh, that is the thesis of the Book of Mormon, and like the Nephite civilization, the Jaredites um, had extreme annihilation even down to the last man. Well, so you get an organization like Farms that says, well, there's 25% of the Book of Mormon. We don't know where it came from. Therefore, it's probably still ancient. That's the wrong end of the elephant. <laughs> because those six sources that I just cited in here within this, and you can get it online, 75% of the Book of Mormon comes right out of Joseph Smith's environment. The King James Bible, the Methodist revivals, Smith family biographical materials, the war strategies, and anti-Masonry. And they say, well, they're going to focus on that 25% that we do not yet know where it came from. But if you're going to make a case for an ancient Book of Mormon people and an ancient record, you better not have 75% of it coming out of his environment, his own backyard. This is not rocket science. This is easy. All right. Let's just go over a couple of more, and then we'll. Um, we could do the same thing with the book of Abraham. Four sources, really quick. Chapter 1 comes right out of Josephus. Joseph Smith family owned a copy of Josephus, an 1830 edition, or copy. Chapters 2, 4, and 5, 88% of those verses come right out of the King James Bible, including those errors. Chapter 3, Thomas Dick's Philosophy of a Future State. That's where he's getting his astronomy. Joseph Smith owns a copy of Thomas Dick's Philosophy of a Future State. Thomas Taylor his 1860 16 book on the six books of Proclus on the theology of Plato tells you all about that facsimile too. There are five or six phrases in there that are right in that facsimile. And so it goes. You can find 100% of the motifs in the book of Abraham in those four sources. And if you throw in the Hebrew names that Joseph learned from Joshua Sexus in the winter of 35 and 36, that pretty well accounts for the names. That's where it came from. Now you, you, can, you can look at the, you know, the facsimiles don't line up with what Egyptologists say, and that's one approach. That's Charles Larson, and it's a good one. Or you can go into the Kirtland Grammar book. That's another way of showing it. 
I chose to just say, well, where did he get the stuff? You know, these four sources I just named. Josephus, the King James Bible, definitely Thomas Dick's philosophy of a future state. You can read more about this. I don't have time to get into that. Um, <clears throat> let's take a look at another uh, aha moment was taking a look at Joseph Smith's sex patterns from 1820, <laughs> 28 to 38. That's a 10-year period. He got married in 27. Bang, right in 27. He's accused uh, by, uh, of uh, making untoward advances towards Emma's good friend in P Harmony, Pennsylvania, named Eliza Winters. Uh, he then goes to Ohio, and he gets accused two or three more times, and more in Missouri. In 10 years, he has nine accusations, one of which is Fanny Alger, another is Nancy Miranda Johnson, and we have little articles appearing where, oh, it's all just smoke, there's no fire. I think there's some fire in at least four of those nine, if I'm honest. But just set that aside. Do you know anybody who's been accused in 10-year period of untoward advances toward a female nine times in four different states? <laughs> New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Missouri. And Joseph Smith is just getting started I could overlook those for 10 years and those accusations, except that he kicks it into high gear in Nauvoo. And there he approaches, well, he got 33 women to say yes. 11 of them married. 11 of them teenagers. And we're finding more. Our best scholar in, Ohio, in, in Illinois is telling me, a month ago, we just found another 14-year-old. Is he, and the family says it was an affair, and the church says, no, he was married to her, as usual. <laughs> but I don't know how you can justify marrying 14-year-olds when the average age of marriage in that era was 20 to 22. So it... Let him go on the 10 years from 27 to, or 20, 38, 28 to 38. What about from 39 to 44? Now, I don't know how he could find that many women to say yes, because he's doing it in about an 18-month period. I don't even, I, I mean, I have to hand it to him. <laughs> how, how do you do that? that What's that? Mm -hmm. I, I'm beginning to wonder if the reason we haven't found too many pregnant women by Joseph is because he was on to the next one right away. I don't know. But this whole sex pattern thing, it just starts from the time he's married and goes right up until he dies. And this lasts Example, the 14-year-old was in the spring of 44, and that's the latest one we know of. Some say there were 35 to 38 marriages. I know one, 44. We're still finding them, folks. What's the name of the 14-year-old? I can't remember. He'll come out. He's going to write some books. He's writing a book on Joseph Jackson. Who's, he's writing one on Carthage. He's writing one on Nauvoo polygamy. And he's good. No. 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 Not a church. I could tell you more, but I won't. You might compromise him. So, let's close with, well, one other thing. Uh, this month I had two articles published in the John Whitmer Journal. One is, uh, did Joseph Smith commit treason? in his quest for political empire in 1844. And you can get that on this mormonthink.com Grant Palmer homepage. It was just put on there yesterday, uh, the finished version. But 
tens of thousands of people are reading it on the internet. Uh, out of the John Whitmer Journal, maybe 200. That's what the internet has done. It's made us all authors. Quickly, uh, the Book of Mormon predicts, especially in 3rd Nephi, that if, the, if this nation does not repent, and that means join the Mormon gospel, embrace it, embrace the Mormon gospel, that the Indians will come through and wipe us out. <laughs> now, I've known that for a long time, but this is the part that was an aha. Joseph Smith had himself ordained king, set up a council of 50 men, to set up little cells all over the place and talk the Indians into joining them and then they're going to attack the government. And you think, that can't be true. Well, I had a federal judge read the paper and I says, what do you think? He says, they'd have got him for treason or something along those lines if he'd have lived a few more years. Anyway, it's in this paper. That was an aha moment for me because I never knew that Joseph was going to organize the Indians. His, his plan appears to be to convert the Indians to the church and then tell them, as the Book of Mormon does, hey, this is your land. You should get off if you're not a Native American. That was his appeal to them. But if they wouldn't join the church, he would just make alliances with them. And there's quite a bit of testimony, and I give three examples of where Smith is trying to have these members of the Council of 50 go out, which he calls princes of the kingdom, and they're going to do what they can to elect him president, and as soon as he's president, then we got a foot in the White House for a theocracy. That's the thinking. Well, I'll pass on that for now, but let me go to, and we'll close with William and Jane Law, because this was a huge aha moment for me, and not that long ago either. I keep finding stuff, <laughs> even though I'm in the twilight of my career. A lot of people know that William and Jane Law published the one and only issue of the Nauvoo, Nauvoo Expository. It's about the size of the Salt Lake Tribune and four pages. You ought to read it sometime. There's nothing in there that's false that I found, not one thing. In fact, William Law joined the church in 36 up in Toronto, Canada, and married his wife, Jane. Came to Nauvoo in 39, and he was put in the first presidency in January of 41. And he stayed there until January of 44. He was Joseph Smith's second counselor, and he was a good man. In fact, we're finding out the good guys are the bad guys, and the bad guys are the good guys. This is an honest man. I really identify with him. We're going back, Tom Kimball, myself, to the, not the current Nauvoo City Council in February, and we're going to talk about William and Jane Law. He became a fish for physician the last 40 years of his life in Apple Valley, Illinois, and Schulzburg, Wisconsin. He was a good man. Did he leave for the reasons we're leaving? No. You read the Nauvoo Expositor? We believe in the Book of Mormon. We believe in the Doctrine and Covenants. They went for far more serious reasons or basic reasons of human behavior. And they really liked Joseph Smith at first. He's in the first presidency. And really he's all alone because Sidney Rigdon is sickly. And so Joseph puts in John C. Bennett for a couple of years as an assistant to the first presidency. But then he does his thing and he leaves. So it's really Joseph and William Law. And William Law is getting more and more disturbed by things. This is what William Law wrote the day in his diary that Joseph Smith was, was killed. June 27, 1844. He, meaning Joseph Smith, was unscrupulous. I had to look up that word. No man's life was safe if he was disposed to hate him. He set the laws of God and men at defiance, unquote. That diary was not published until 1994.
Well, why did they leave? Joseph told John C. Bennett while he was still in favor. These are members of the First Presidency. I haven't seen Order and Porter Rockwell around for a while. Oh, I sent him to fulfill prophecy. That meant kill ex-Governor Boggs. That meant that he was going to go after Boggs because he had driven the Mormons out of Missouri. William Law said the same thing. William Law wanted nothing to do with Mormon, and he would not give an interview until the last five years of his life. And his kids, who were really solid citizens, he had a doctor and a judge. And the judge says, Dad, you really need to say a few things. And the very first thing out of his mouth, he, he conducted one oral interview. That's it, folks. Three letters and one oral interview. And the oral interview, before it got even started, it says, he talked about this hit on Bog. He says, Joseph Smith told me that he sent, he sent Rockwell to, to murder, to kill Governor Boggs. And these are the words he used. And you don't forget st stuff like that. I don't care how many years have gone by. And he wounds Boggs. But he, he's put in jail, but he's never convicted, or in Rockwell. They tried to extradite Joseph Smith. The governor of Illinois, Thomas Carlin, says, you've been making predictions about me too, Joseph, and now I'm starting to believe him now that Boggs has gone because there's all kinds of witnesses that heard you say in that little grove in Nauvoo that Boggs would die within a year of violent death. And now it's you've, somebody's attacked him. I think it's you. And if you come after me, I'm, on, I'm watching you, you see. Now, I think, just really quick, Joseph can justify, well, Warren Rockwell fails, so he hires Joseph Jackson to finish the deed. He offers him three grand. And Joseph Jackson lays it out what happened. And he talks about it. He reports back to Joseph. Well, this is a little heavy, I know. And, and, I, and I don't know if anybody would believe it, but I think there's the last 18 months of Joseph Smith's life, he was doing things that just took William and Jane Law aback. The second reason they left is that and this is in 43, June of 43, Joseph already has 21 wives. And Emma says, hey, if you can do it, I can do it. I only want one man, and I want that sweet little man, William Law, that counselor of yours. You're gone all the time. I want him for a sexual substitute. And that's the word that William Law uses, sexual substitute. And so Joseph gets a revelation on it. You can read it in section 132, verse 51. Yeah, go ahead and offer it to him. And so Joseph and Emma are approaching William and Jane Law for this kind of deal. And the law say, uh-uh, I'm not doing that. So then Joseph has a revelation. He says, Emma, if you keep doing this, you're going to get destroyed. God will destroy you. In other words, you're going to, you're going to disappear. And that's the way she took it. She thought her life was at danger. She didn't comply. You are to accept Joseph Smith, your husband, and all his wives. The original deal was you can have law if you will let seven of these younger wives live in the mansion house and quit harassing them and so forth and so on. That's the, that's the offer revelation in detail. And the, and the laws say no. And that's another reason they left. The third reason, Joseph's very persistent. He's also narcissistic and extremely grandiose. More than I had ever thought. The third reason is he has himself ordained king of the earth. And that he's a god to this generation and presides in the spirit world. And the laws go ballistic over this in the Nauvoo Expositor. So those are three reasons, really quick, of why they're leaving. They published this one issue of the Expositor on June 7th, and by June 12th, they'd left town. And they walked away from their business, 
their farms, and their cities. He and his brother Wilson Law, who wasn't a member, lost about $30,000. And so what is the law's final testimony of Joseph Smith? It says, we know for a fact that he broke seven of the Ten Commandments. And they list them. Taking the name, using the name of God in vain. Murdering people. Jesse ja Joseph Jackson said that Joseph tried to hire him to kill Law. William Law says jo Joseph and Hiram tried to poison him. Joseph was going after his own wife if she kept in this. I think he went after Boggs. So you, be, you begin to see a, a different reason why they're not re re leaving the church because the Book of Mormon's true or the priest it's not so. They're leaving for far more basic reasons. And it's just as well, they'd have lost their money anyway because the LDS were driven out of Nauvoo shortly, not too long after that anyway, but he, he claims he and his brother lost $30,000 so they've walked away from everything. That's the sacrifice they paid. And at the time, that was a very real concern. It's just as well they did. About the time that the laws left town, William Wines Felt, Phelps, W. W. Phelps, wrote a poem called Praise to the Man. Praise to his memory. Death cannot conquer the hero again. And it appeared in the August 1st issue of the Times and Seasons. William and Jane Law couldn't sing the song anyway. And they left. Nauvoo never to return. Thank you. Sure. One of the things that I found curious were your conclusions at the end. It seemed to me that you were saying that you know, the church has all these foundational problems, there's holes all over in the foundation, but it's still worthwhile, it's still good. They just need to de-emphasize the whole Joseph Smith narrative and start emphasizing the Jesus Christ narrative and we'll get back on the right track. Would you, if you <coughs> could rewrite the book today or update it, would you change those conclusions or would you still maintain that uh, the Mormon church is worthwhile, they just need to emphasize Jesus Christ more and Joseph Smith less? Well, churches don't disappear, they change. And I'd like to see him change to a more Christ-centered experience. And yes, I'd write the same conclusion again. Can you accept the fact, as many of us do, that it's not a church per se, it's a church cult. Structured as a church, functions as a cult, as a result, from the, our perspective, has no redeeming features. Well, I don't know about all of that, but uh, <laughs> I like to say it has a number of cult-like behaviors. It goes over well with a TBM better than you say. It's a cult, but that's me. Um, I think it does have a number of cult-like behaviors. Um, as for the rest of that, uh, they do some things right, but they, look, they won't do what they're asking their members to do all the time. And the word is repent. <laughs> and it's disturbing to us that they keep perpetuating it. And they are perpetuating it. But I think the air is slowly going out of the balloon because of their vitality. You, you cannot do this. There's starting to be little tiny visible fissures in the dam. It's going up and it's going down and it's going all around. And those who value truth more than loyalty to a tradition are going to find the truth. It's out there now, thanks to you folks. Aside from the fact that they're corporate religious
this product is uh, declining in value, how can you say that a church is worthwhile that practices racism, sexism, homophobia, and is anti-family? You're right, they need to repent. <laughs> In many ways, it's acting like a corporation, isn't it? And this is what this gentleman is saying back here. There's no question about it. This is not the church of my youth. They used to tolerate oddballs in the wards. And I knew a lot of them. They were just off the wall. But they, oh, that's just Brother Henry or something. Now they hold a court on you. In keeping with the same discussion, I see the good work the, the valuable contributions um, to which you refer and to which you question as part of the facade in which to keep the corporate um, uh, like gang or, mm -hmm. or mafia connection and hold from the top of the pyramid down to the people on the bottom who are very sweet and sincere yeah. and kind and loving. They are, and they, they don't know about most of the stuff we've talked about. No. Chapel Mormons don't know hardly a thing. But, but then, therefore, I'm saying the good deeds that we can all point to are part of the facade, which keeps the... It's an inoculation, isn't it, to keep you from looking? Yeah. That's what Farms is trying to do. Frank, where do you see the church in... 30 years time as far as doctrinal changes, uh, do you think that the Book of Abraham might get dropped? Um, anything else that you foresee coming? Well, when we reach a tipping point, and where it probably won't happen during my lifetime, when we reach a tipping point where there's so many people saying, hey, I'm not going to discipline this person because what they're saying is true. When the leaders start, you know, acknowledging that on the the ward and stake level is where the church operates. If, they, if, if large numbers of those start to go, they, the church knows they've got serious problems. I think at the top, it's going to depend who is in charge when that happens. And then, you know, you had the Protestant Reformation, Luther, they protested. That's what they, we were doing. We were protesting. And they made enough inroads that eventually they had a Catholic counter-reformation where they tried to clean a lot of stuff up. It didn't work, but they tried. And the Mormon church thought all this was nailed down, but the internet has brought it all back. The English Bible was to the Catholic church what the internet is to the Mormon church. What's going to happen? I think it will become more and more irrelevant. Younger people will read the Book of Mormon and say, man, this is racist. <laughs> you know, we, we are, most of us are older and we knew both sides of that. They're not, I think things are going to get less racist in America. There are going to be a lot of intermarriages, first of all. What's going to happen? I think they'll do anything to perpetuate the church. But it will change, just like the Catholic Church changed. But it does go on. People who think it's all going to disappear, they're, they don't know history. Uh, this is kind of along a similar line. Um, where you were talking about it will change. Uh, do you care to say anything or your opinions about if there are any church leaders we're aware of now that you think might be capable or are more likely than not to help those changes happen? Well, I've been told they have somewhat of a division among the Quorum of the Twelve. There are those who want to open up the history and those who don't. The problem is you have to have unanimity, and until Elder Packer goes, there's no chance. <laughs> What's that? Why don't they inquire of the Lord? 
Why don't you write him a letter? Um, hi, Grant. Thanks. Thank you very much for your book. It helped me out a lot. And there's a section where you talk about a um, kind of a fairy tale story that that kind of aligns with Joseph Smith's experience with Moroni. I was curious if you could let us know how you made that connection, because that was an interesting portion of the book that was brand new to me. Then I have a second question. Um, I always try to hypothesize who amongst the 12 and the First Presidency kind of recognize that it's a fraud, know that it's a fraud. I, I kind of like your speculation there, if you, if you can. Well, 10 years ago, I would say that the top leaders, I think they really believed it. They'd gone to seminary and institute and primary, and they believed it. And they know that our best historians are questioning it. They know that. And they know there's a lot of people resigning and it's starting to filter up. As to who that might be, you know, we're just speculating. But what I said at the outset today, it is reaching the higher levels of the church. It may be a time, and I'm not predicting this, but it, look, if Mikhail Gorbachev could come out of the KGB and finally see the light about Russia's future, or lack thereof, they were becoming a third world country, except they stole all our stuff, then I think it's possible for an apostle who becomes president maybe to say something, but they're changing things. Now it's not just the prophet speaking, it has to be the whole 15, so that makes it more difficult. Um, I don't know if that's, did I answer your question? Yeah. yeah exactly. What was the second one? The, how you make the connection with, um, oh, the golden pot? Yeah. People either love that or they don't. Um, this came about from one of our senior historians at the Smith Institute was asked to do background for the Martin Harris W. Phelps Salamander letter. And so he started looking all over for salamanders. And he got this novel, 70-page short story by E.T.A. Hoffman, who you know for other things, The Nutcracker. Um, and he said to me one day, he says, I'd like you to read this and we'll have a discussion. So we did. I read it seven times and I thought, well, there's, there's a lot of stuff here and we both agreed that there's some connection there. So I wrote up a paper and eventually became part of my book. You see, we've never had an explanation of where Joseph Smith may have received the angel gold plate story. This is a source. It's a first. It's to make a point, not to prove a point. And I have, I think our man is Lumen Walters, if for those of you who read my book. He's the most likely candidate, and I have found out a little more information about Lumen Walters. He went over to the Sorbonne in France, in Paris, and he studied with a Anton Mesmer's disciple. Well, Mesmer and Hoffman were best friends. Hoffman used to go and watch Mesmer, you know, mesmerism. Um, he'd look at his patients in an asylum, and that's where he got his ideas for his characters, for his writings, including good old Anselmus in the Golden Pot. And then he comes home, and there needs to be more research on that, and I understand that someone is finally picking up that torch, because I think the next generation needs to pursue that. Uh, anyway, I wrote it up, and I probably needed to put it on a matrix, as my good friend keeps telling me over and over again. But if you, if you read it two or three times, you'll begin to see more parallels. I mean, look, Archivarius Lindhorst was the last archivist of Atlantis. That's what Archivarius means, archivist. Well, guess who was the last for the Nephites? Moroni. And so it goes. Okay, one more question. 
Um, thank you. Um, can you comment on the status of FAIR right now? And um, the second part of my question is, is there any involvement from the church leadership with FAIR? I mean, I know not publicly, but maybe privately? It's a good question. I don't, I don't know anybody who knows the inside story yet. I don't. All I know is that they didn't like the mean-spirited part of what they do on a, on a BYU campus that gave them certain perks and credibility. And my, my very strong guess is that they have failed to stop people from leaving in droves. And so Marlon Jensen, if you listen care carefully, he says they're going to go our own way and have write things up. Because, in other words, FAIR hasn't done the deal. They haven't made the case. And I think it's very hard to make their case because they don't have the ammunition to do it. The documents are quite overwhelming and what we're talking about here today is true. And it's like a minefield. I mean, the only surprise is how big is the explosion going to be? <laughs> is it going to be a little one or a moderate or a whopper? That's how bad. And I, like you, felt duped. That's the word I used to use. Yeah, I went there looking for information to um, find out that what I was being told wasn't true. So that's why I asked. Yes, that's happened to quite a few people. Well, you've been a good audience, and, a, and a thank you very much for your kind attention. And uh, good luck and as, as pioneers in our quest to be more articulate for people who want to know. You know, people who come into the church, it takes about seven, five to seven hits to come in. Well, it takes about five to seven to go out. So don't give up. <laughs>